Good afternoon. I'm Linda Marban, and I'm the CEO of Capricor Therapeutics. And today I'm going to be talking to you about an overview of CAP-1002 in patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We're a publicly traded company, NASDAQ listed, and our symbol is CAPR. So Capricor has been developing cell and exosome-based therapeutics for a few years now. We are in late stage clinical development with CAP-1002 in Duchenne muscular dystrophy and have now presented very exciting data uh, that I'll be sharing with you on our phase two clinical trial for which we will be working with FDA to try and get approval as quickly as possible. Our exosome platform technology is being used not only to develop the exosomes themselves as a therapeutic for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but also we are using them as a platform to build therapeutics and vaccines for delivery. Um, we are based in Los Angeles, and I look forward to telling you the story of Capricorn. So Capricorn's CAP-1002 technology is an allogeneic, which means off-the-shelf, cardiosphere-derived cell. This is not a stem cell. They don't engraft into cells or do they become part of the functioning tissue of a host, nor do they actually ask as, act as the repair mechanism. What they do is even more exciting than that. They release exosomes. Their mechanism of action is the release of these exosomes that contain nucleic acids, um, such as microRNAs, non-coding RNAs, and proteins. They're actually how cells talk to each other. So it's the communication device by which cells give information to each other and can change their behavior. We have identified three of these microRNAs that are very important in the mechanism of action of CAP-1002 potency, and we will be talking about those more uh, in the future, but for now, they are the major part of the potency of the cells. The cells have been in over 150 patients to date, so that we know it's very safe and um, therefore makes it a very good therapeutic uh, for approval. So just like most of the companies and labs that are active in the Duchenne muscular dystrophy fit space, we have regulatory designations with the Food and Drug Administration that is supposed to make our path easier. We have RMAT designation, which is Regenerative Medicine Advanced Therapy. It's like breakthrough for cells and genes. And then of course we have orphan drug and rare pediatric disease designation, uh, which allows us to get one of those coupons upon approval, which will be very helpful in helping us or others move things very quickly in a pediatric form. Uh, to approval. So I want to spend a few minutes and talk to you about the preclinical data that we collected with CAP-1002 and the MDX mouse. The MDX mouse is a naturally occurring mouse model of muscular dystrophy that's used in many muscular dystrophy type studies as they prepare to enter humans so we can actually see what a potential product does. This is a busy slide with a lot of information on it, but I wanted to show you that not only did we do experiments to look at the heart disease, the skeletal muscle function, and diaphragmatic muscle function, but you can then actually see the data so that you can actually get a sense of what we found. So we found that we had improvements in ejection fractions in the treated mice. That's the ability of the heart to meet the needs of the body. The mice that were treated, and they're shown by the bar here, are able to run farther and longer on a treadmill. In every one of our studies, the bar that you see at the top or the line that you see at the top are normal healthy lab mice. And we use them so that we can make sure that our experimental technique is not deficient in any way. But you can see that uh, the MDX mice that were treated with CAP-1002 could run farther and longer on a treadmill. This is a study of isolated leg muscle. And a mouse is called a soleus muscle. In a person you might call it a quadricep muscle. And really the only reason you see two lines here is because the CAP-1002 treated mice had performance that was so good, it's superimposed on the control mice. So the mice that did not get CAP-1002, their muscles did not contract nearly as well as either the control mice, just a regular lab mouse, and the MDX mouse treated with CAP-1002. So now we have three pieces of very important evidence of how CAP-1002 works in muscular dystrophy. It helps improve heart function. It helps improve global skeletal muscle function by allowing running to go farther and longer. The actual muscle itself is working better. And in this situation, we looked at the diaphragm. 
Now the diaphragm is so thin that it's very difficult, in fact, almost impossible to measure its function. But what we could do, and we show here in this graphic at the bottom, is measure fibrosis or scar or damage to the diaphragm. And in the C MDX mice treated with CAP-1002, you see much less fibrosis than in the mice that were not treated. So taken together, we see some very important findings in this preclinical mouse study. Heart disease is better, exercise capacity is better, isolated muscle function is better, diaphragmatic muscle function is better, suggesting that the mice will be able to breathe better. This preclinical work took us into our first clinical trial, which is called Hope Duchenne. We were targeting the cardiomyopathy associated with Duchenne. We are primarily focusing on improving the cardiomyopathy, the heart muscle performance. And then we also were looking for skeletal muscle performance. Because we were looking at the heart disease most closely in the first trial, we naturally tended towards enrolling older patients that were more impacted by the disease. In fact, most of the patients in the trial were not ambulance. And what we found in this open label randomized study of 25 patients, 13 got cells and 12 were standard of care. We gave them one infusion of cells over the course of the year. So they got it once and we followed them for a year. And the cells were delivered into their coronary arteries of their heart, which means that the subjects had to come into a cath lab and they weren't really anesthetized, but they were made comfortable. And then a catheter was put into their heart so the cells could be delivered directly there. All patients that Capricorn treats are on corticosteroids. And as you well know better than anybody, the limited options that are available for these later stage Duchenne patients. What we found, and what I'm going to show you in the next slide, was staggeringly positive and very impactful. We saw an improvement in cardiac scar at 6 and 12 months measured by MRI. We saw improvement in heart function, and this was looking at small specific areas of the heart where we actually thought the cells might have the greatest impact, where the scar is the greatest. And we saw improvement in skeletal muscle function, harking back to what we saw in the mouse studies, that the cells were working the same in the people as they did in the mice, which is that they have impacts in heart and skeletal muscle. And we published this in the Journal of Neurology uh, just last year in 2019. To remind you, if you don't know, uh, with later stage Duchenne and with other diseases where ambulation is no longer possible, we use something to measure upper limb strength or shoulder, arm, and hand in the artist. The one that we use and the one that's the most uh, vetted and credible out there is the performance of the upper limb. We call it commonly the pull. And it's a series of tasks that are analogous to activities of daily living that can be done in a lab and quantified back and considered a qualified validated assay of performance. This test was developed by physicians, physical therapists, parents, and even the subjects themselves. And so some of them are things that you'll readily recognize could impact your normal daily living. And that's why they were selected for this type of analysis. There's um, the latest version of the performance of the upper limb is the version 2.0. It's like a smartphone. It gets better with each uh, version. This one uh, makes uh, quantification of tasks much easier, reduces a floor and ceiling effect, and removes some redundancy. Shown here is some of the most important data from the Hope Duchenne clinical trial. Shown in the upper left-hand side, and I think you can probably see with my cursor, this is an actual representation of MRIs of the heart, magnetic resonance images of the heart. The top one is a series of images from one patient at baseline, six months and 12 months. This was a CAP-1002 treated patient. And then the bottom is a usual care patient, baseline six months and 12 months. White is scar and black is healthy tissue. And what you can see in the image of the CAP-1002 treated patients is it looks like holes were being poked in the scar by the end of the study, reducing the amount of scar in the heart and hopefully leading it to function better, which our data showed. Whereas in the usual care patient, his scar stayed the same. And in fact, one could argue got thicker and a little bit worse by the end of the study. This data is validated in these charts shown here. Blue are the placebo or usual care patients. They didn't get placebo in this setting, um, but the usual care patients, red are the CAP-1002 treated patients, and we see a reduction in scar both at six and 12 months um, after having a CAP-1002 infusion, whereas the standard of care patients did exactly what you'd expect these uh, patients to do uh, with not treatment, which is the scar in their heart got a little bit worse.
We have functional data to support that the function of the heart was better during this time as well, and that's in that paper that I mentioned in the Journal of Neurology. We also measured the performance of the upper limb. Remember, we showed preclinically that the cells seem to work in the heart and in the skeletal muscle. So one infusion of cells we tracked for a year. What we saw very clearly, and that's why it's highlighted with this box out here, is the best performance of the treated patients shown in red over the first three months. Sure, they did better over the course of the year, but they really were better over the course of three months. Whereas the usual care patients did what you'd expect them to do, which is stay the same over the course of the year. So this led us to the conclusion that we would like to move forward with this clinical evaluation and investigation. <coughs> excuse me, with the HOPE 2 clinical trial. But we made a few changes along the way, and that's um, what has made this such an incredibly powerful trial. We did a uh, phase two randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial. The patients were those with DMD and reduced skeletal muscle function. Uh, we were looking for the safety and, of course, now the efficacy of CAP-1002. But here's where the change took place. Remember I told you in the first trial we did one infusion of 75 million cells in the coronary arteries. But while that study was going on, we were back in the lab trying to figure out if we could deliver the cells in a different way and still derive the same efficacy. And the good news is we could. So now we are able to deliver 150 million cells because we're not in the heart intravenously. So the subjects in HOPE2, and hopefully once this gets to market, um, any patient that uh, is believed to potentially be beneficial to, we'll go to an infusion center or someplace um, very local and very easy, um, get a simple IV put in their arm, um, have it delivered over the course of 30 minutes, observe for a few hours and go about their business. And this would be done every three months. Uh, the clinical trial was at a nine uh, Duchenne sites across the United States, they're Duchenne care sites, so they were very carefully selected and vetted. And the data that you're about to see is from 20 patients in the ITT population. Who were the patients in HOPE 2? Well, they were teenage boys primarily. The mean age was 14.3 years. 80% of them were not ambulant. And almost all the patients, in fact, all the patients were on steroids for the entire trial. Just so you understand sort of the target patient population um, that we've seen uh, the best benefit in is the patients that have the performance of the upper limb and they have scores on a scale of zero to six between two and five. This allows us to have a good window of opportunity to which we can see change. So they're not uh, so um, able with their um, skeletal muscle function that we wouldn't be able to see change as would be the case if they had six in tasks. And they're not so impacted um, yet by loss of muscle function that um, we may not be able to make a difference if the fibrosis may be too um, established. So this is sort of the Goldilocks zone, somewhere between two and five uh, are the ones that we're targeting for our clinical trial. Now let me share with you this very, very exciting data. Shown here um, is the performance of the upper limb. This is the version 2.0, as I mentioned, the better version. It's a validated measurement tool at this point of upper limb function. And this is the full performance of the upper limb, taking into account the, the shoulder, arm, or mid, and distal, which is wrist and hand, um, parameters. And what you see is that in red, the placebo patients decline the way the literature suggests that a patient will decline over the course of a year. Um, they have about a four point change from baseline that are slowly going down. Whereas in the treated patients, that decline is um, hovering about 1.5 points. So significantly less decline in the treated patients than in the placebo patients. And this is uh, represented and validated here in this scatter plot where you can actually see um, the individual patients in the trial and where their performance was. Now let's talk about heart function. As I mentioned, and I think every one of you are aware, the heart is sort of the colloquial ticking time bomb in Duchenne. Everybody knows that it's impacted by the disease, but as yet there have been no therapeutics that directly target um, the heart function. And as um, patients and families um, you know, march on into teens and 20s, this becomes front and center in the lexicon of worry. What I'd like to show you today is a ray of hope into that paradigm. Let's talk about uh, the parameters that we measured. Um, shown here are four bar charts, and it's a busy 
graphic, but I like to show it because it sort of gives you all the relevant information in one place. This shown here in the upper left is ejection fraction. Ejection fraction is how the heart meets the needs of the body. And it's the industry gold standard in sort of understanding cardiac performance. In fact, every one of you that has a son or is, is a subject themselves, you will know what your ejection fraction is or was last time. I'll tell you it was 50%, 45%, 60%. And we know 55 to 70 is about normal. What we see here, and you know, we always have to do everything based on statistics, you know, what's the likelihood that this is real? And the likelihood that this is real is extraordinary. 0 0.004 was the p-value. When you compare the placebo, who are declining about two percentage points over the course of the year, whereas there's literally no decline in the treated patients. Now, you could say, okay, two points, um, you know, what is that really gonna do for my, my, my patient, my family member, myself? The answer is, is uh, it's a trajectory of time issue. Um, if you can uh, attenuate delay, if you can preserve two points of uh, cardiovascular function per year, you really are in a very good position uh, to maintain healthy cardiac function. And that's why we're so excited and laser focused on this parameter. The bar charts on the right here, left ventricular and systolic volume and left ventricular and diastolic volume. And diastolic volume is sort of when that's the least amount of blood that you have in your heart. Um, at the end of, or end, sorry, end systolic volume is the least amount of blood that you have in your heart in the cardiac cycle. And end diastolic volume is the most amount of blood that you have in your heart at, in the cardiac cycle. And when you look at those, you can get a sense of the size of the heart and the health of the heart. And these are very important measures. They've actually been used as surrogate endpoints for approval in clinical trials of important medications like ACE inhibitors. Because what we learn from the size of the heart is that the heart functions as a physical organ um, by the property of physics. And so it has to maintain the right size and shape so it can develop enough pressure so that the blood can be supplied to the brain as well as to the toes. And in this situation, um, when you have a disease, if the volumes change, in other words, the heart can get bigger from the disease process, it can generate enough process to meet the needs of the body. In this situation, getting smaller is better. So you can see the CAP-1002 patients are getting better. Their left ventricular and systolic volume is getting better. And their left ventricular and diastolic is volume is getting better, the heart is shrinking back towards normal size, and that probably is attributing to this improvement in function. Finally, and as a scientist, what I find uh, most reassuring about this data set is an improvement in a marker of cardiac muscle decline, which is called creatine kinase. Creatine kinase is an enzyme that is uh, used by muscles to function. We typically only see creatine kinase in the blood when muscles are being broken down. Um, it's very high typically in Duchenne patients because their muscles are always being broken down. There's three fractions of creatine kinase. One is the creatine kinase MM, that's for skeletal muscle, BB, that's for brain, and MB, which is for the heart. And what's incredibly amazing about this data set is that in the CAP-1002 patients, the amount of CKMB or the enzymes that are being released from cardiac muscle cells are down to nearly zero. Whereas in the placebo patients, there is a lot of CKMB in the blood, suggesting that they are in fact still breaking down their heart. So taken together, a very strong indicator that cardiac function is being improved by CAP-1002 in patients with advanced phases of DMD. In terms of safety, it was a very safe trial. We had um, one site hypersensitivity reaction um, in the HOPE trial and one in the HOPE OLE. Um, this was an anaphylactic kind of reaction, which can be very dangerous. But when a procedure is done in an infusion center or in a hospital, um, medications are ready in case it happens. Um, we were um, able to institute a pre-medication regimen um, into this program where um, we have had no hypersensitivity reactions since. Um, and with that in mind, I would like to say that we are incredibly excited to show the first placebo-controlled trial showing improvement in upper limb function in non-ambulant patients. Um, with also improvements in cardiac structure and function. I didn't show you today for brevity, but we also are seeing exciting trends in respiratory function. We are seeing uh, the correlation between the improvement in cardiac function and a measure of cardiac function, which is CKMB, the creatine kinase.
And the results in both of our clinical trials are, re are remarkably similar um, and also hark back to the preclinical data suggesting that the mechanism of action as we have defined it is appropriate. We are working now with FDA. We um, have um, now work towards giving them data and information. And we'd like to see some version of approval, especially in this environment where COVID um, is making it more difficult to do clinical trials, but we'll see what FDA says to us. Uh, we're transferring our technology to a global contract manufacturer. It's called Lanza um, in order to scale up uh, so that we're ready when we come to market. And we're starting an open label extension imminently um, of all the patients that were at HOPE2. So if you were in this trial, you were eligible for four doses of cells um, because we don't want to unblind you, we want to continue to follow you. And finally, I'd like to thank all of the investigators, all of the sites, the physicians, the steering committee, but mostly and most importantly and always are the patients and families, those people who trek to centers and to sites and to you know, hotels and leave other children at home so that so we can move this field forward. My goal is that uh, you'll have to go no farther than 15 minutes from your door very soon uh, in order to get this therapy for your patients with Duchenne. And we have a very strong advisory board. We have a unique therapeutic one that targets both skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle, one that goes along with every gene therapy that's out there. So gene therapy away. Um, you can get CAP-1002 along with any gene therapy, any CRISPR therapy. Um, and so the people that are working with us are very excited about this too. With that, I will say thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, good luck to you and to your families. And um, that's a wrap.